Target for Saturdays. This month we are celebrating, as we always do in March, Women's History Month. we bring to the museum, we always have a lot of women change makers here in the museum. We're also celebrating the 8th anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, which was the first, first center for feminist art in a major museum. And then the quote here that is really inspiring um, all of the programs here tonight, it's from Malala Yousafzai. Sorry, I always get her name wrong. But um, you know the Pakistani uh, uh, activist, um, education activist. And she says, when she's talking about um, women in education, she says, I raise up my voice, not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. So the two dynamic, Powerful women we have on the stage to today are Tavi Gevinson and Anna Holmes. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of each one of them and then let them get on the stage. So Tavi is a writer, editor, actress, and singer. Um, she came to public attention at the age of 12 because of her fashion blog, Style Rookie. By 15, she had shifted her focus to pop culture and feminist discussion. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of the online Rookie magazine, aimed primarily at teenage girls. In both 2011 and 2012, she appeared on the Forbes 30 Under 30 in Media List. In 2014, she was named one of the 25 most influential teens of 2014 by Time Magazine. In 2012, um, she appeared in a public service announcement for um, women's rights and organized a Get Well Soon um, car drive for Malala after she was, um, she was shot. And she has been doing amazing things ever since. She's going to be in communication today, and she's going to be in conversation, not communication, with Anna Holmes. And Anna Holmes is the, um, the founder of Jezebel.com. Do we have any Jezebel fans here? Um, she has written and edited for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Newsweek, InStyle, and New Yorker Magazine. She's the founder of Jezebel.com, and in 2012, she was the recipient of the Mirror Award for Best Commentary. In 2013, her Twitter account was named one of the top 140 Twitter feeds by Town Magazine. As, and she says, at which point she became incredibly self-conscious and stopped tweeting as much. <laughs> she is the editor of two books, including the book of Jezebel, which is here on the three, the three slide slideshow. And she works as a columnist for the New York Times Book Review and as an editor of Digital Voices at Fusion. Um, please welcome Tavi Gevinson and Adam Holmes. Last thing, there's going to be a book signing in the bookshop. Tavi has her book. She signed all of the copies. She's going to be personalizing them, and you'll have an opportunity to take a photo, do whatever you want. Um, but that will be on the first floor immediately after the conversation. So can we give them one more round of applause? <laughs> she's been doing and um, I'm happy that you're here and I'm happy that you're living in New York now. Um, so the discussion is going to be about, or at least it was billed as being about, um, us having a conversation about creating media um, for and by women. So I'm going to, you know, Tavi can ask me questions, I'm going to ask her questions, um, she can throw them back at me. Uh, but what I want to know first from Tavi is, um, I know you've been asked a lot of times about 
why you created Rookie. What I want to know is, when you were thinking about creating Rookie, what did you want to do, what did you want to accomplish, and what did you want to avoid? Um, so I think uh, part of it was that I had been writing my blog for a few years and felt like I'd had this good, this really good formative experience of just like musing about my life and what inspired me and the uh, things that I was discovering, like movies and stuff. And then I felt like I had met other, um, like in the fashion blogging community, I felt like I had met other girls who were into fashion but also interested in feminism and mm -hmm. were also starting to kind of write about it. And uh, I felt like there needed to be a kind of home <laughs> base for all these like really talented other young people that I saw on the internet. And um, I also felt like, uh, like I was starting to enter high school around that time. And um, like when I think back on like, I don't know how well versed you might be in like uh, what I wore when I was 12. <laughs> but like I see some pictures of like me at Fashion Week when I was 12 and I'm wearing like the craziest shit. And I'm just like, the only way that worked was because I was prepubescent. So I had not yet been hit by just like the like teen insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so then I like kind of stopped being interested in fashion and also was hit with teen insecurity. But also saw all these really cool writers and artists online who were going through the same things. And it seemed like natural then to kind of want to collaborate with them. And, um, yeah, just create something that wasn't condescending, wasn't um, trying to sell its audience something yeah. all the time. It's, you know, uh, when I think about Jezebel, I mean, there were, we tried to cover a lot of different topics, but there were some topics I didn't feel like I knew how to cover, mm -hmm. which meant that we just didn't do it. Um, one of which was makeup. I mean, I'm wearing makeup, I have no problem with makeup, but I, one of the ad sales guys you know, had made a comment about us wanting to, or him wanting us to do more makeup, posts about makeup, because it might attract advertisers. And my, my first reaction was, I don't care about advertisers. But the second reaction was, I don't know how to talk about makeup in a smart way, other than that's a nice color of lipstick. You know? Right. <laughs> um, and, and so we, I just avoided it altogether. And so I'm wondering, for you, are there certain topics that you, with Rookie, don't feel that, that, that you are equipped to cover because you don't feel that you would do it in the right way or you don't know how to do it in the right way? I think that, um, I mean, with something like that, uh, like I, don't, I wouldn't know how to write about makeup. And I also was, like, one thing I was conscious of was, like, I don't want to, like, feel like I'm trying to sell people something based on their insecurities. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is what a lot of media for women is kind of like based on. Um, and I also like had these ideas about fashion and beauty, uh, which was like, I'd been wearing this crazy shit and I was like, it's fun and it's a way to express yourself and it, for me it was, um, I mean this word is kind of overused, but it was empowering and it was like a way of, uh, expressing my identity and to me that felt feminist but I mean I remember though that when I started Rookie I felt like there were a lot of websites for women just not one ones that I saw and really connected with for um, teenagers mm -hmm. but like when Jezebel started there wasn't even that landscape like it was kind of the first like what do you feel like has been the biggest change from then to now well, there were there were definitely sites that I would that I think that um, I mean basically what I should say is just go back to like my teen years. I was a teenager, I guess in the late eighties, <laughs> which dates me, and I read Sassy, and so I, that was that was the that was like the creme de la creme. Like I, if I if I could inspire that feeling in other people, um, I, I would have wanted life at least temporarily. <laughs> I'm not sure that Jezebel did that, but that's what I was trying to go for. Um, although for an older audience, not a, not a teen teen audience. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there were certain, like, we were taking a page from different types of media that were out there. At the time, in 2007, what I noticed, I'm not saying this, is, this was um, objectively the truth, but what I noticed in, in online media were that young women um, my age, younger and younger, were 
being marketed to, like there were websites for them, but it was either like very broad stuff like I Village, like I don't even know what that was supposed to be about. It was yeah. just like a collection of things about women, um, <laughs> like in parenting and stuff. And then there were sites that tried to sell you things, um, like fashion or beauty, uh, or, or, or just like lifestyle sites like Daily Candy, which were essentially trying to um, push products on, on young women with disposable income. And then there were gossip sites. And you know, this was the rise of, kind of obsession with celebrity culture, and so it made sense that there were lots of websites that had pictures of celebrities, um, mostly paparazzi photos, but the way the ways that women were presented on those were, in my opinion, really um, destructive. They were usually being pulled, you know, picked apart by the male bloggers um, for the ways they looked, and, you know, is she fat, is she pregnant, you know, looks, she looks so sad. It's like stuff that had to do with their appearance and their romantic status and, and nothing to do with their talent as um, an actress or something else. So I figured, well, young women are obviously spending a lot of time on these gossip celebrity websites. And yeah, even I'm kind of fascinated looking at paparazzi pictures of people. Um, but so we're gonna put that stuff on this site, but we're not gonna tear the women apart for you know, um, a wrinkle in her dress that might be a pregnancy or um, the fact that she doesn't have makeup on or yada, yada, yada. So I was trying to kind of bring, I was, I was trying to make a site that would appeal to young women that wouldn't be so insulting to them. Um, because, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up when there was no internet. And so I was not being bombarded with images well, I was being bombarded with images that were unrealistic, but they were pretty contained. You know, they were in Cosmo, or Glamour, or Vogue, but they weren't all over the internet. They weren't in my Facebook feed, because there was no right. Facebook. I mean, it, it, it just felt, I, I felt really sorry, and that sounds patronizing, and I don't mean it to be that way, but I felt pained at, at, at what it must be like to be a teenage girl, being inundated with the sort of stuff that I was seeing, and at, as, and then 34 year old found problematic myself. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think also um, sassy for me was like, I was 13 or 14 and found out about Sassy magazine from the late 80s and early 90s um, for teenage girls. And I found out about it through having I, th I think on like other friends' blogs or something. And then I did a trade with a girl because uh, I was trying to find copies and she like mailed me like a year's worth. Um, what did you give her in return? I think I gave her a mixtape. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she still has it. And I hope so too. I hope she wasn't just like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and they were so, I felt like they were still, I mean other than certain things like New Kids on the Block, which I was still also like, all right. I felt like they still resonated with me, you know, like 20 years later, um, just because the women in, who wrote for Sassy were, um, I don't, yeah, they weren't out to make anyone feel bad. Or the mm -hmm. weird thing is that we're like, oh, we have, like all this culture that's made for us by men. I think a lot of uh, media that I find not particularly feminist is also often made by women, and it's mm -hmm. like internalized, mm -hmm. uh, internalized misogyny. Like you're like, I like a on a different scale, a version of that is like judging what your friend eats because you're like, well, I don't want to eat that. Like right. just projecting your own, and then it becomes like a magazine, and it's like in CVS. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, have, having having worked with some of those uh, magazines, some of which are better than others. Well, first of all, I think a lot of them are better than they used to be. And I think a lot of them are better than they used to be because the internet demonstrated, women's websites, um, the good ones, demonstrated how kind of out of touch those magazines were. There is a very big difference between Cosmo and Glamour of 2008, which we made fun of mercilessly on Jezebel every day. I mean, there was so much stuff, there was so much material. Um, and those magazines now, like they, they, yeah. I think they got a little freaked out by the sort of, you know, um, stuff that was being lobbed at them by us and by other sites like us, and, and also saw that there was a hunger for something that was more than 52 sexy sex tips to make him sex you up <laughs> on, on, on Sexy Saturday. I mean, like, like, like that sort of stuff. And I mean, so, I know we're joking, but like, yeah. can I find something? 
Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to write some of those stories because I worked at I worked at Glamour when I was in my late twenties, and the glamour that I read as a teenager was a different glamour than I encountered as an adult. The glamour I read as a teenager was very good, actually, and I would actually describe it as a feminist magazine. It wasn't overtly so, but it was, um, and it was edited by I believe its founder, the woman who founded it, Ruth Whitney. Then she passed away, and then the editor that I worked for came on board. Um, and she had come from Cosmo, so she was Cosmoing yep, um, Glamour. And it was not the magazine I read as a teenager, and it was, I was asked to write the sorts of things that I just made fun of. Um, I think the worst story was, well, in, in terms of being incoherent, like, I think it was, what's your secret sexual personality? And usually, usually, the, the, usually what happened with these stories is the editor would decide on what the story headline was, and then she'd ask you to create a story around it. You know, my experience, this is what I learned in school, is that you, know, you have a story idea and you report it out, and, 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 and then you see where it takes you, and then you figure out the headline. You don't like, right, use the headline. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, she, so yeah, she'd think of things that obviously would, make, would look maybe good on a, on a on the CBS newsstand, but didn't necessarily have any basis in reality. So, like, what's your secret sexual personality? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how I, how, I, how I executed that. But that sort of stuff was, was upsetting to me as a young woman and as a writer, but, and also having been, having created that sort of material, I knew how much women's magazines were just bullshit because I was right. like, creating some of it. Right. <laughs> but, like, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Like, yeah. Saw what yeah. Was, yeah. But I will say that the, a lot of the women that I worked with, that most of the people on staff of those magazines and editorial were then and still are women, were very smart. I mean, so I, I actually wouldn't say, say so much it was internalized misogyny, at least in my, in my era, mm -hmm. so much as it was the mandate of the publisher or the, pu or, or, or the, right. the company that owned them to, to, to make money, and they made money by selling advertising, and the advertisers would get freaked out by anything that was remotely political right. or, or, or controversial. So, so that, you know, all these really, I think, talented, you know, capable women, writers and editors, um, were, were finding themselves creating crap and not really wanting to. Right. And also that they were being funneled into these women's magazines because they were profitable and they weren't going to close down. And the kind of, the kind of higher brow magazines that existed in New York tended to be staffed by um, white men, just to put it very, very bluntly. Um, and that there wasn't a lot of room for women. So I'll just, I'll kind of, I'll kind of, um, uh, fight for the women that I worked with, not always the editors, not always the editors-in-chief, who didn't really take chances, but they're, we, we were all very frustrated. Um, but actually, that was one of my questions for you, and I think in the green room we talked about it, um, about, well, not so much internalized misogyny, but I was going to ask you what destructive messages about females um, you've internalized in, in your life, whether in your younger years or now. Um. For years, I've been trying to figure out my secret sexual personality. <laughs> just really messed me up. Um, I mean, that honestly makes me imagine a page where they just have like all the characters from like Adventure Time, and they're like, pick one. Like, <laughs> um, um, well, I think I. So I'm trying to think of what I consumed when I was like really young. Yeah. And on one hand, I read my older, I have two older sisters, and I read their magazines, so like early 2000s, 17, and Cosmo Girl, and YM. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I feel like all that really, uh, the biggest thing I can think of is like, then having a really weird idea about like gender roles and relationships and something, yeah, your sexual personality. <laughs> like all of these weird things that we invent to try to figure out something that's really just like a friendship with sex editing. <laughs> um, and I, I think, but I felt like it was countered by a lot of, like I really liked reading when I was younger and um, I felt like I, which we kind of talked about mm -hmm. this too, like I had really good kind of role models even in just like the picture books or like chapter books that I was reading in elementary school. Just a good, sassy, like Pippi Longstocking mm -hmm. or um, uh, the girl with the purple purse or whatever. 
I don't know that one. Wait, what happens in that one? She was a mouse. Uh-huh. Um, the purple purse was so inspiring. Um, I, but there are definitely... Distra I mean, I realize now that I've danced around the question. I do think there's something to be said for, like, um, my friend was just telling me about uh, an op-ed that she read, so I didn't read this, but um, about how, by a psychologist in the Times, about how more women uh, now than ever are being diagnosed, or being medicated for like anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And that does make me wonder, I think everyone has to take care of themselves. Um, but it makes me wonder if there's an attitude we have towards sadness or sensitivity or being emotional that's linked to uh, femaleness mm -hmm. and stereotyped as really feminine. And I definitely think that, you know, I've probably internalized something about that being like, um, you know, too feminine or annoying or something. Well, did you, I mean, when you were younger, or even now, I mean, we can talk about the past tense if you'd rather not talk about the present tense, but do you, um, did you worry about your body, you know, when you were 11, 12, 13, did you die, did you think you had to diet? I mean, because I, I remember very distinctly feeling those ways, and, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking to look back on it, because I grew up in a household, I think, that was similar to yours, and that I, I, I wasn't being raised by parents who were uh, expecting me to look like a pinup, you know, and in fact, we're trying to communicate the very opposite of that, um, that I should, um, Try and develop my mind and my personal relationships, not my physique. But yet, I was beset, like many teenage girls, with a lot of insecurity about that. I think something crazy has happened, which is that I look at my body now in a way where, like, I, it, um, the way that I do it, I'm like, this never happened before. I never had this thought before. I made it through all of high school, mm -hmm. and I think it's without like looking in a, the mirror in a certain way. And I don't know, and it should be the opposite. Like that should have happened in high school and I should be fine now. And I don't know what happened there. I don't think that, I, I, I mean, just to, just to say, I don't think that's true in the sense that they're actually, I think this like stays with people for a long time. So yeah. I don't know that you should be over it by now. And right. I have a lot of friends who are my, who are my age who actually it got worse the older they got. Because right. Well, I think part of it is also like in high school, I'd go to school and be like, I don't care about, like, I mean, if you, like, I just had my friends, like, that was all I needed. I wasn't, um, I wasn't part of, like, a circle in high school where, um, looks were much of a currency, and now I guess I'm like, I live in New York, I'm gonna be a young woman, and like, <laughs> and maybe that comes with that, and it's, like, not something I even think I truly care about, or, yeah, used to give time to, and suddenly I'm like, Oh, I guess I have to care. Like, it's, um, I listened to an interview with Christopher Noxon, who is a, a novelist, and he's the husband of Genji Cohen, who created Orange is the New Black and Weeds. And he wrote a novel called Plus One about, um, being the, about a man who's the husband of a m much more successful woman. And, um, he said that, he was like, I've never been anything but really happy for her. But if, when the man is the successful one, people congratulate the wife. And when the wife is successful, people go up to the husband and go, how you doing, are you okay? Yeah. Um. And, um, and he was like, when enough people ask, are you okay? You're like, oh, should I be worried? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe even part of it is just like, these being the things that I think about all the time with Rookie, and then, I don't know. Well, do you think maybe that you're a Sorry, this became therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious because, like, because, because now you're an act, now you're also acting, and like that is an industry that, that historically has been one of the worst in terms of what it's, the pressures it's put on women, right? So. Yeah, but I also, but I think because I like feel like my home is a community that's like, yeah, looking at that stuff and talking about why it's, uh, why it can be problematic. Like, I feel pretty safe in terms of, um, like, I don't, it, it's not that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's just, like, what you grow up or, I mean, no one's safe from it. No. 
I think the honesty. I think go through phases too. I mean, I've had better years where I don't care about that stuff, and then years where I right. feel paralyzed by it. So, it, it, but I'm not trying to be, you know, depressed by saying it doesn't go away. <laughs> it, I, I do, I do think getting older. I can only speak as a female. It does get better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I hated my twenties. Um, but I, I think I think it does get better in terms of your your, your understanding of yourself and how you um, how you see yourself in the world and, and you know. Um, but 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 I don't know that that kind of certain little twinges of self loathing go away completely. Um, right. or, or, or comparing yourself to other people or, or standards of beauty in society. That said, I do think it's a lot better now than it was because uh -huh. you have more examples um, in the media of different types of beauty, mm -hmm. um, different body types, different skin colors, I mean, just stuff that I didn't see when I was, when I was growing up at all. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was all pretty much supermodels um, uh, that were size six and, you know, um, were, were fantastically gorgeous and that's what was really um, celebrated. So I think it's, we're, we're, in a good, we're in a good period in terms of, I think, what representations of, of different types of beauty in women and, and, and uh, but it's still very difficult and, and I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't wish I was a teenager again. Yeah, well, that, but I do think in some ways it's also better because you can curate what you see mm -hmm. more now. Mm -hmm. And there's also like such an amazing community supporting. Like when I say like I don't think it's because I go on auditions for acting stuff now. I think it's because it's like I'm used to like a Tumblr dashboard full of people being like love yourself, and that like that's a good thing to internalize. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I mean in a way, like I feel like a few years ago people were talking about you know, websites being new authorities the way magazines are. And now I also think that there's just such a, you know, the democracy of Tumblr, like you curate what you want to see and um, like a thought goes, like a brief post goes around a lot because a lot of people like it and not because they know necessarily who posted it or um, if that person is a writer or journalist or authority figure or public figure. And I think that's like, and like I think the role of a teen magazine, like I don't even think seventeen or um, sassy or rookie, like I don't think any of those things could be um, what, in a way, could be like what sassy was to you. Just because I think there's a good thing happening, which is that teenagers, young people, like listen to each other more now. Yeah, and they can, well, they can communicate with each other. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I had a phone, I could call my friends, and that was about it. Right. Uh, and then, you know, the magazine came in the mail. But yeah, you can really, there, it seems like you can find more of a community now because of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever met the, the women who, who worked with Sassy? Who, well, you I met Jane, right? Yeah. Um, I think I have, in brief ways, met some of the other editors. <laughs> Was it, was, is it, was it weird for you to read that magazine when, since it was set in a, in a different era? I mean, um, one, thing, one, one thing that appealed about it to me was that they talked about New York a lot. And that's kind of annoying in a way now um, because what I, when I was running Jezzle, I didn't want to talk about New York a lot. I didn't want to make it seem like New York was the center of the universe. Right. Because it isn't. But part of what drew me to New York was Sassy Magazine and that and the fact I wanted to work in magazines in general. Um, and, you know, I... I actually saw one of the editors in the New York airport when I was returning to college in New York uh, after Christmas break. This was like 1992, and I almost like fell over. Like she was like a rock star to me. I didn't say anything to her, but I'm curious to know, like, um, what your experience reading Sassy was, seeing that it's from an even earlier era, and uh -huh. and 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 if there were things you took from Sassy that you tried to bring to Rookie. Um, whether it was that sense of like personal connection, using you know writers using their names um, or talking about themselves in the first person. Yeah, I mean one of the first like kind of seeds I planted in trying to get to like gauge uh, the interest or like how realistic the idea of starting rookie was, the interest of other people was like I gave a talk um, at a, an ideas conference in Toronto about sassy and just like how each of those things would look today. And that basically did, I mean, I haven't 
watched this talk or looked at it since I gave it um, like four or five years ago or something, but I think a lot of it was like, I liked how they didn't, um, like celebrities weren't like idolized. Mm -hmm. They were appreciated for their work or could be, well, that's one thing that's interesting and that I didn't want to do, was that Sassy in a lot of ways started um, being sassy about like celebs in a way that I think was at that time really new because other teen magazines were just like, she's amazing about like someone who maybe sucked. Um, <laughs> but I, whatever. No, um, I hear you. <laughs> we can talk about like Shannon Doherty, like I don't think that's <laughs> my point, but um, I, so I think like that was one thing that I did take away as not like good for the modern era because I think that was something that started but then like yeah there was like gossip blogs happened like that tone became something that I then felt like and eh, there's no need for um for us to I think you can like be critical of celebrities or artists but it felt like um kind of tired to take on the too much of like a sassy tone and also rookie is so different from what sassy was in that like we're not interviewing the new kids on the block like we're not they did interview like every mainstream celebrity and everything so it makes yeah. sense that it would be more varied and we really just kind of have q and a's with people that we really admire and that our readers really like you don't have like pull out pin up posters of like teen <laughs> idols. No, but we Although should. Although you should. <laughs> just, just, just for fun. Yeah. One, of, one of the yearbooks, that would be really fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I remember about teen magazines. Not sassy. And maybe not even why I'm already 17, but you know, there were like the, the teen like magazines. Tiger that were, yeah, or like teen. I think there was one called Teen that was like, done in, in fluorescent colors. And there was always, I think it was Sean Astin. That was the era of like Sean Astin being adorable from Goonies. Um, I'm really dating myself, but... No! Uh, <laughs> Goonies, please drop that reference anytime. I had such a crush on him, I saw that maybe like five times. <laughs> um, I made my dad take me every single time. Um, uh, we were talking about books, um, but we kind of already answered that, that, that question. Um, oh, I wanted to know, what's that... What's that, if you, if, you, if you know what the number is, what's the percentage of, of, of individuals who are reading Rookie who are male? There's no way um, for me to know, yeah. but I feel like we get a fair amount of emails from guys who are like, oh, this thing about street harassment, uh, you know, helped mm -hmm. me understand why that is me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not very bright, these boys. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, that was really poor paraphrasing. It's <laughs> funny though. <laughs> um, did they ever ask you? Did the victim dice ever write in and say, "Why don't you write more about men?" Or, or... I, I mean, I feel like there's some of that. I, but, but well, I feel like there's a. I feel like there's some like, "What about guys?" And I'm just right. like, eh. "But there's some." <laughs> but then there's some that's also like, "What about um, if I feel like I don't really know if I identify as a girl or a boy?" And that's when I'm like, "Oh, it should like." Even the language around, um, like I, when I started, I was like rookies for teenage girls because mm -hmm. I was looking at like, you know, what a teen magazine was normally uh, considered to be, and like the other girls that I knew and what we needed, and um, more and more, it just seems like uh, it's just for teenagers. Yeah, a lot, a lot has changed in terms of our our. our our ideas about gender and our concepts of gender and also, um, you know, when I started Jezebel, it was for female, it was for women. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, there wasn't even that much content on the site that, that, that acknowledged um, the lives of gay women. Uh, there was some, but there wasn't as much as there should have been. I, I remember I, I, when I was much younger, I did a book of breakup letters written by women and men. Because um, I'd written a breakup letter and I was cathartic, <laughs> and I wanted to collect other people's breakup letters. And you know, looking back at that book that came out in 2003, which was a while ago, but still, there were no letters from 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 one gay woman to another. It was all heterosexual relationships being being presented, and that didn't really even occur to me that much. I mean, I remember it kind of did, but 
you know, that would just be, I, I would feel ashamed of that. I, I, I think that because we have evolved in, 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 I think, very important ways in terms of how we think of what a woman is mm -hmm. um, or the female experience. Um, yeah, I don't know that if I started as well today, I would say it was for women. I mean, no, or, or, no. Or, I would, or I would have this, the same sort of content. I think I would make a, be a bigger effort to represent the lives of women who are not heterosexual. Well, I, and I think what you said about how, um, you know, the Cosmo today is so different from the Cosmo. Like, I think everything is kind of because of probably mostly like Twitter and Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Um, everything is so, like, there's not really a line between, like, mainstream and underground. Like, a lot of people are getting the same information, so I think more and more, like, you get called out, or someone says that they don't feel represented, and it's no longer, like, um, something that stays contained in a space. It's mm -hmm. like, the people who work at these larger, like, Condé Nast publications do hear that. It's all mixed in, and it's great, and like, I think that's a really good direction to go in, and I also think, like, I mean, I would say the same in terms of representation issues at Rookie, and I feel like the answer is always just like, like, let's get more people in here. <laughs> like, I don't, I mean, when you were like, do you ever, are there subjects you feel not equipped to talk about? It's like, yeah, I have a very narrow experience and a very privileged experience. And so then you have to, um, I feel like there are a lot of people on the internet, like everyone wants to be good and nice and figure out how they can be helpful to issues in the world. And I have just found that like, it's not really, they're not really mine to talk about, but the good thing about having this platform with a lot of writers is like, then you spotlight the person who should be talking about it and who can speak to it in a much more real and useful way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just like a really basic blanket thing about, I don't know, empathy and not just wanting to like uh, hog the stage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, yeah, no, that's it, right? <laughs> I, um, well, did you ever feel like it was important to call Jezma a feminist website? Um, I purposely didn't call it that mm -hmm. because the owner of the company wouldn't have liked that. Uh -huh. um, so I decided to be more, I, I was trying to be somewhat subversive about it. So we would use the word feminist all the time. Um, and, use, and use the word feminism and talk about it all the time. And it'd be in headlines. In fact, uh -huh. I had a special glee of putting the F word in, in a headline, just to like drive it on repeatedly. Um, I had grown up in, a, in an era when the word feminist was a bad word. I didn't consider it to be that way. I didn't grow up, I, I never had any problem calling myself a feminist. I, but I was the minority, uh, at least in terms of my, my peer group of, of females, of girls and then, you know, even in college. Um, so I felt that, I, I was aware of the fact that it was a word that a lot of women, young and old, tiptoed around or, or mm. thought meant something, you know, um, right. negative. And I felt the best way to counteract that, at least what, what we were doing, was to repeat it over and over and over again, to like, rob yeah. it of its power, but also give it power in a way. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't, I never called the site a feminist site, and there was a reason for that was, again, I think the owner would have been like, that's not what I hired you to do, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but also because there were sites out there that were explicitly feminist in a way that we were not. And I felt that to put ourselves in that category with them would have been insulting to them. Um, sites whose purpose, sole purpose, was to uh, examine gender politics right. um, through a feminist lens. Whereas we didn't always do that. Sometimes, you know, the writer, one of my writers would, would you know, do a fun post about the anthropology catalog and how ridiculous it was this yeah. month. And, and then there would be, you know, something about the Oscars. That, I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to front, the, the, and I didn't want to put us in, in, in this, at the same level of, of, of oftentimes smaller non-for-profit non mm -hmm. sites that were doing this in a much more sustained and serious way. Right. So, I didn't call it a feminist site. Other, pe other people did, and I didn't really 
mind if it did, mm -hmm. but I don't think that we were on the same level as, as some of these much smaller sites that, again, were, were more labors of love. I mean, again, the jazz ball was, you know, supposed to make money. Mm -hmm. um, I was getting paid to do it. It wasn't, I wasn't just doing it out of the goodness of my heart. <laughs> I was getting a paycheck, so yeah, I was, it, was, it was not like my second, my second job. Um, and, you know, it, it was, you know, I felt that way about other words. Words that I felt the society or women or just people in general had tiptoed around a bit. Um, whether that word was feminism, whether that word was racism or talking about racism. Um, uh, I, I think that some people blanched because of the sheer number of, of headlines on the posts that we put up that had to do with rape or abortion, which mm -hmm. I was like, we're just going to call them what they are. I'm not going to you know, use euphemisms. Um, I just felt, I, I personally felt very fed up with um, women's media at that time and also the ways in which I felt like we weren't talking about stuff that goes on every day mm -hmm. and that is important and that the best way to deal with that was just to throw it out there and hammer it home. And we got complaints. I mean, not no one complained and said, stop using the word feminist. But there'd be a lot of people who would write in, oftentimes dudes, who, who were reading, I guess, who would say, we get it, we get it, you know, like, I get the point. Stop writing about X, Y, or Z. Stop writing about, you know, break the military. Stop writing about yeah. the, the photoshopping of, of, of actresses and models and women's magazines. Stop complaining about this. I mean, when you tell me to stop something, I'm just going to keep doing it more. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, also, that's a weird thing to be like, this personally hurts me that you're talking about this horrible yeah. issue in the world. Yeah, they just, they just stop reading. But, um, but, you know, I mean, the internet was also different then because Back then, people were going to a, a homepage and refreshing it all the time. And uh -huh. that's not how anyone reads the internet anymore, at least I don't. Right. I look at it, I, I find stuff through Twitter or Facebook. So mm -hmm. I was very aware of what messages the site was, was communicating to people who came there because they would see you know, a homepage that had a number of posts with different headlines and photos. And everything had to be, in my mind, curated in a certain way to, um, to, to give to put across a certain sensibility, and, I, and, that, and that might be somewhat lost now with online media, which isn't a bad thing, but just that people don't think go to homepages anymore the way they used to. I mean, uh -huh. I don't, um, and, and even my mother doesn't, and I'm not trying to insult her, but, <laughs> <laughs> but she's, she's not someone who uses social media, but uh -huh. even, even she doesn't go to nytimes.com in the same way. Right. So, um, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that I, I never, I had the same feeling where I never ID'd Rookie as a feminist website because I do feel like that's a community of sites where, like, yeah, the primary focus is, like, feminism, the movement. And I felt like, um, I think I've referred to it as feminist, like, as an adjective because I think it's part of the lens through which I view my work and my life. And I think a lot of our... Uh, contributors and staffers feel the same way and that just kind of naturally uh, becomes a part of it mm -hmm. but I also yeah it's like walking the line between like um, wanting to take away the stigma by using it a lot but also wanting to without watering it down mm -hmm. like um, I guess like I had to all right, so like on one side you have um, saying it a lot to remove the stigma and talking about it a lot. And then on the other side, it's like, okay, well, I don't want a girl who, as you know, I once thought, thinks that um, feminism is like man-hating and the hairy armpits or whatever, to come to the site and immediately go like, oh, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it was always kind of like figuring out a way to take away the stigma while also like slowly brainwashing girls into good self-esteem <laughs> via being feminist like um but well, yeah but i think but even like when i started rookie which was only like three and a half years ago it was totally different from now where i don't think there's like i i i don't know what this says about like culture and the way our we let ourselves be influenced <laughs> even the fact that like Beyonce and Taylor Swift will call themselves feminists, I think, like, makes a huge difference. Someone asked me the other day um, on a panel uh, I was on, or asked the panelists and yeah. first directed it at me, about whether, you know, feminism was trendy. And, I mean, I've been hearing this for a year and a half, two right. years. And I hate, well, I don't hate the question, but it does, 
I think that part of repeating that word um, over and over and over again is that then it may lose some meaning. It may reduce the oh. stigma, but then it may lose some meaning for some people, or it certainly does for me, because I'm not saying I wouldn't call myself a feminist, I would. But I do see uh, invocations of feminism or proclamations that I, that seem a little watered down. I think right. I, like I once told someone I was like skim milk feminism. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, this is getting into like very dangerous, not dangerous territory, but complicated territory because you know I, I don't know that there's a checklist of, that you have to you know, fill out and either you are a feminist or you're not. But the idea that it's trendy, I, I don't want to think of it as something that is a dress that's in season. You know, uh -huh. um, or, or, or that's or that's something that's being put on as an accessory, um, and then only to be discarded, which mm -hmm. is what basically kind of what this woman was asking me like is it is it is it an accessory of sorts? Um, and you know, if you'd asked me six years ago, seven years ago, if I'd ever get that question, I would have laughed in your face because no one was talking. To, well, no one in the broader media that is mm -hmm. in popular culture was talking about this stuff. On the other hand, it does make me a little uncomfortable. Like when I saw that big. Feminist sign behind um, Beyonce. Did say feminism or feminist? Feminist. feminist. I was. Sh I mean, I was shocked, but part of me also oh. was uncomfortable because it was a big spectacle and it was a big award show, and right. I'm not accustomed to seeing that sort of thing. So I might just be like an old funny daddy in a way. Oh. <laughs> um, but, 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 and, and I'm not accusing Beyonce yeah, of, yeah. of watering down feminism, but I do. It does make me a little nervous sometimes. Um, how much it gets bandied about. Because I'm not sure that what it, I'm not sure that people are articulating a vision of feminism beyond girl power in some cases. Uh -huh. And that's what concerns me. I think, um, like when I get asked if I think it's trendy, like my immediate answer is like, no, it's not like, a this year's VMAs, Beyonce is going to stand in front of a screen that says misogyny, like, <laughs> which will just be funny. <laughs> right? But I think the danger is that, like, the natural cycle of things is that there's then a backlash, mm -hmm. and that's when you do get dudes going like, uh, "Stop talking about rape in the military so mm -hmm. much," but it's not just like an email. It's like I don't know, a piece on the Daily Beast or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know why I threw Daily, I was just naming a website. Um, you just them. Uh, no. <laughs> just kidding. Websites okay. have lots of lives. I know. <laughs> I'm just saying it's on a platform yeah. that, well, there, yeah, there was just like a New York Magazine thing where this guy was like, this guy, um, but where a, white man was like... Was it John Chain? <coughs> yeah, the thing that was like, we need to stop talking about, we have to stop being so PC and... Yeah, that was John Chain. Um, <laughs> uh, I was rolling my eyes at you. I was rolling my eyes at him. Um, yeah, you know, well, here's the thing. I think, I think in terms of, like, previous backlashes, that... Yeah. Perhaps they were more organized. I'm not sure that a backlash would well, actually, like previous ones against feminism, would work in the same way. Because right. I think that there's been something unleashed that's great, and that and that people are not going to shut the fuck up about it. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and the more they get told to shut the fuck up, the less they're going to shut the fuck up about it. So I think that I think actually that like I, I don't think we're going to see what I saw in the '80s or what Susan Faludi wrote about in her award-winning book. And I, I, I'd actually love to ask her. Um, in person at some point, you know, how, how she thinks a backlash against feminism would evolve. I'm not saying it's impossible, mm -hmm. but I don't think it would have the same impact. I think that there's enough media liter literacy, media criticism, and awareness of gender politics um, that, that, is, that is at the forefront of so many conversations now, but I just don't think that, that, that um, the haters would get away with it as yeah. easily. Um, you know, that said, you could argue there is a backlash, there's a, Backlash against women's, women's reproductive rights uh -huh. um, uh, in, in many parts of the country. It makes me feel like we're, you know, in another era. Um, mm -hmm. But I just don't know that. I don't know that the same sort of messaging that took hold in the 80s and, and, and 90s would be able to do so today. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, you know, I would like to speak to someone who actually would be an expert on that, which is not me. It would be probably Susan Faludi. Um, we had talked about in the green room. 
the idea of being a woman. And I and I said to you, I said, do you consider yourself a woman? And 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 then I admitted that I often find myself like I don't know flinching at using that term to describe myself. I would I wouldn't describe myself as a girl. Mm -hmm. um, I I preferred to grow women as girls before, and then I have to catch myself. Um, not not in an insulting way, but. <laughs> right. um, you know, if there's someone walking down the street, you know, and she looks to be under 25, I'll be like, that girl has a cute, you know, cute dress on, but she's not a girl. And so I want to know about um, how you self-identify and about the language that we use and how you use language on Rookie and in your conversations with friends. And are you yeah. a girl? Are you a woman? Are you, are you both? <laughs> um, we say, I mean, I think on Rookie I mostly say girl, but I think that's the same as young woman. Mm -hmm. Like, I call myself a girl, but I also call myself a young woman, and I don't really find myself identifying as a teenager just because I'm not in high school anymore, yeah. and I'm not going to college, so I feel like I just like enter the uh, adult world or something. Um, but I, there, there is something about woman that, I said this when we were back there, but that feels like, um, like you feel like just by calling yourself a woman, it's somehow the equivalent of doing like "I am woman, hear me roar" karaoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it feels very like I don't like it makes me think of the Sex and the City theme song. Like it, something about it feels like, um, which is weird. It's just woman. I, I don't know. think any guys like, am I a man? Like <laughs> I know, but what is that? Like I, I actually can't parse that because I feel I feel similarly similarly to you sometimes, but it, it, it makes me feel kind of like icky. Um, <laughs> I mean, the idea of like, I'm a woman. Um, yeah, you really have to figure out my secret sexual personality. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a young woman. I mean, maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's like an age cut off at which point I can accept the, the, the term to describe myself. And I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if someone described me as a woman, I wouldn't argue against it. I just don't know that I would, maybe I just don't define myself by my gender first and foremost. Right. That could be it. Um, but I don't know. I, 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 it, it, it's tough because I don't hear adult men referring to other adult women as boys, and yeah. unless they're racists. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think and, unless they're unless, unless they're talking. It, yeah, I forget it. So, I think someone the other day said something about didn't didn't like um, that crazy conservative guy um, whose name I'm forgetting now called the president a boy recently. I, 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 I'm going off script, but... Uh, no, that's totally <laughs> the no, way to go. I, th I think this is what's... Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure there's an answer to this particular question because I don't know that I have an answer myself. It's just, it's just interesting to me that adult females, women, myself included, sometimes flinch at, at describing ourselves as, as women. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know why that is. And I, maybe it's yeah. something for Ruby. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't like, uh, if someone calls me a young girl, I don't like that, because I think it's like, that came about because they were trying to say young woman, mm -hmm. but they don't want to say woman, so they say girl, but a young girl is like a four-year-old, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know, yeah, I think I don't think about it, though, that much, just because I don't think gender first. Yeah, I think also, you know, with, with females that, that youth is prized, much more in, in, in females right. than men, um, and you know, specifically regarding their their fertility. For you know, that sounds very scientific, but uh -huh. you know, uh, whether they are of, have reached you know their reproductive age and whether they're you know sexy or hot, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's what we've internalized is this, this idea. Maybe that's why we call ourselves girls sometimes. It's because oh. you know, our youth is our youth is, is women is, is females is prized, mm -hmm. um, which I hope changes um, considerably over over the next you know few years and decades. Because um, the people that I admire the most, the women I admire the most, are all older than I am, uh -huh. and they always have been. Well, also prizing youth is or like fetishizing youth is like. Um, fetishizing not life. Like it's like saying that experience or wisdom or knowledge are like unsexy and mm -hmm. weird. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I mean, and it's weird because in a lot of ways I'm like somewhat of a, a figure of like youth and like, I don't 
powerful youth, I don't know, but, um, and at the same, and I also think like some young people do need to feel like empowered and like given a voice, but at the same time, I, I shy away from, I'm wary of uh, ever feeling like I'm trying to sell youth or contribute to the culture of like, the, I mean, life is good. You want to keep living. You don't want to like try and be younger. You can't. It's impossible. That means <laughs> that you're like fighting every second. Um, but, and I do think it is more like of a, um, an asset for women than for men. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I had mentioned this to you backstage that I wanted to ask you about is I think that you, as a 19-year-old, are in contact with more older women than most 19-year-old young women are um, because of, you know, you have to deal with, you know, publishers and, I mean, listen, I'll put it this way. When I was 19, I was in college and I just dealt with college students and, like, we smoked pot and, like, had... Yeah. Sex. Um, <laughs> and like, you know, I had like a, a boss at my like, work-study job, but I didn't have to deal with that many adults. I think that, yeah. you, that you kind of encounter a lot more adults than most people your age. And so what I want to know from you is, um, what would you tell older people um, about young women that, that, that they don't know or appreciate? But what would, what would you tell young women about older people, older women, that they don't understand and appreciate? Because I do think that you have a, a, a better kind of vantage point than, than most people. Mm, I don't know. I, I feel like the gap is closing in a way, just because we're all consuming a lot of similar stuff um, online. Like, the generation gap gets smaller and smaller. But I think that one thing that frustrates me is when older people um, talk about uh, social media or just like computers being harmful without also talking about all the ways in which they empower young people um, to, yeah, to like have a voice in the way that you didn't when you were, when you were a teenager and it was just magazines. Um, and I guess young, I think, um, I don't know. I think the biggest thing is realizing like if, I, if I'm like going to my young friends and being like, let me tell you something about old people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I think the biggest thing is just that it doesn't feel that different. Like I feel, cause also I know a lot of, um, like I've been approached by women who read Rookie who are women who are like in their twenties or thirties. And for them, it's not like, uh, like, this helps me relive the glory days of high school, because that's not even what Rookie is about, as you probably know if you read it, but um, they're like, that's something I still deal with. Yeah. And, I mean, even what we were talking about with, like, body image, like, yeah, those things don't really go away, so I think um, when we, um, like, I, like, you watch certain TV shows or movies, and it's like, that are about teenagers or, and made for a teenage audience, and it's like they were like, okay, we gotta give them cell phones and robots and whatever. But like, <laughs> Freaks and Geeks is a show that was short-lived but really good and like that a lot of like young people at my high school were watching on Netflix because they just pulled from their own experiences. Mm -hmm. And like, I just think that like as a kind of overall writing, creating philosophy, I just think that you can't go wrong with just like, laying out what you feel and what you know and um and with rookie like in trying to like a few weeks ago i did like a tech conference in california where um it was all you Is know this the recode recode yeah. Yeah. and um the q a that i did the guy was like everyone here is working on something where they're trying to get through to uh, like you and your audience and teenagers and like, what's the secret? And I feel like, like when I'm working on Rookie, I want it to be useful to the reader. I want them to like come away from it with something new, but uh, trying to figure out why, like how to grow an audience, like all that, like I, and I should think about that stuff more than I do. Like, I'm not a good businesswoman, but I just feel like it, 
I don't know, like every, um, I feel like all the really strong and popular rookie pieces were just like, I'm gonna put it out there and be honest and mm -hmm. let's hope people like it. Not like, how do we market to this audience specifically? So I, yeah, I, I don't know that you're a bad businesswoman and I've said that about myself as well. I, I, I'm not a businesswoman at all, but people have said to me, um, how did you know how to do that website and that uh -huh. it would be popular? I'm like, I didn't know it was gonna be popular. I did go on my intuition and, and, and my own frustration with the status quo at that time, mm -hmm. but that wasn't because I test marketed anything. I didn't know right. it was gonna work. So I actually, I actually think that maybe being a good business person or a good businesswoman is to just do what you know and do what you want. I mean, not, yeah. not to, I, I work at a company now that is, um, mostly trying to attract a millennial audience. And I hate the word millennials, and I right. say this quite often. I don't want to talk about millennials. I, in the same way, I don't want to be discussed as a Joan Xer. Um, uh -huh. The minute you say that, you are you know that you're being marketed to. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure there's really any difference between myself and a millennial other than the fact that they were born in a different year. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very possible that, that the stuff that I want to read and, and produce um, is going to be of interest to them if, if they have a curiosity about life, and I don't think that uh -huh. like that's you know the, the domain of anyone over or everyone, everyone over the age of let's say 35. So I'm, I think that maybe that's a good way to do business is to just do what you know and do what you love and to use your intuition. Um, yeah, that sounds kind of like well, so at least that really, way. But no, I mean, I'm, and then at least you have like a clean conscience about not being like. A, I don't like Donald Trump. Like, <laughs> at least you don't feel like you're trying to scam anyone. Right. And also, I think it's really transparent when, like, like we all know what link bait looks like or mm -hmm. clickbait. What's wrong? Um, I, think it's, I, I think both words work. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, they they sound the same, but like you can see through that stuff. And I think um, the same way where, like, in person, you can tell if someone's trying to like project an idea of who they are so that you'll like them and feel a certain way about them instead of just like having a conversation. And I think, um, I mean, that was one thing with Rookie when I started it, I remember something that I kept saying whenever I had to talk about it was like, I felt like I couldn't find a publication for young women, teenage girls that respected our intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so I think you become condescending when you like try to get market too specifically or something. Or when you're trying to give advice to people, and, you know, when, when you don't even, yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, advice, I'm, I'm very worried about advice columns because I'm kind of, kind of the opinion that nobody knows anything and no one's in a position to give somebody else advice, um, at least generalized advice. Mm -hmm. um, what are, are there any things that you've ever published on Rookie or written on Rookie or otherwise that you've regretted? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, the internet, I started a blog when I was 11, so the internet is littered with my mistakes. <laughs> um, I mean, nothing comes to mind specifically other than just like general ignorance, like a like poor use of language, like a not inclusive use of language. Um, but, Things don't stick out as like, no, I mean, things do stick out. I don't know why I'm blanking. I'm not trying to get out of this, I swear. <laughs> well, I think if you asked me the same question, I would, I would say, yes, of course. But then if you were asked me to give a specific example, um, I would, it would be hard for me to kind of categorize them in terms of like, that's the worst thing I ever wrote or published. Right. Um, you know, I, I think there are more generally or broadly, there are things that I wish that I had done differently, like what I talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, not being so focused on the, the lives of, of heterosexual women, for example, both in a book or on a, a website or both. Um, you know, and, and actually I'm sure if I went back and took a like tour, grant tour through everything I've written, I would find lots of things that I wasn't happy about, but I don't mm -hmm. do that. Maybe I should. <laughs> no, I know. Well, I, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's helpful to get called out, and I think, and that way you don't go mining through stuff you wrote years ago 
I mean, I think also outside of just like, you know, um, like ethics, I also just don't go back because it's just too weird. It's just, yeah. I mean, reading an old diary is weird. Like seeing old pictures of yourself is weird. It's just like a mind blowingly bizarre thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that you also you become really critical of yourself creatively, and I think it's hard to move forward. And yeah, it's not it's not good. I did though today. I mean, it's weird that you would ask me that now, or that we'd be talking about this now, because today I did actually look at a blog post from when I was way younger, um, where I just where I said something like. I wish I was a cat because then I would have nine lives and I could do all the things I want to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's that's not that's not too bad. No, it wasn't. But I was still just like, oh, idiot, cats. Why? Like, <laughs> hey, I love cats. I mean, at least you didn't write a story like I did that I found in my mom's house. You know, when I was about seven years old, that wrote about a girl who loved dolphins, which is like so <laughs> cliche. I just feel like every girl loves dolphins. Every girl wants to be a marine biologist. So I was just <laughs> hitting the stereotype right there. Um, <laughs> I was ashamed when I read it, but no. But that's the thing, though, is that I'm like, that's amazing. Like, you're never as bad to anyone else as you are to you. That's true. This is true. Um, we have to. I just got to wrap it up. So oh. we're gonna have um, questions. Yeah. So we have time. So we we thought we'd let you guys just talk for more time than we planned. So we have time for maybe two questions. So if anybody really, really, really oh, wants you can, a question. You have to get up and come to yeah, the, you can, to the One problem, question right? here, one question there. The first ones to make it up are the ones that are going to get the <laughs> <laughs> so Oh, there's here. also a signing in the gift shop after, yeah. by the way. So people can ask questions there. Okay. We can chat. Oh. We will take, if they're short, we'll take three questions. So one, two, and Yeah, three. actually one thing I want to say is please ask a question. Don't, just, no, no yeah, just ask, ask the actual no question. Stories. <laughs> so let's start with you on the right. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. So um, I'm fresh off leaving a job where I was working at a young women's television network, and I'm very curious to hear from both of you about what you see for you know, obviously the future of feminist media, but specifically for television, because I feel like there's a lot of moving and shaking happening, and, you know, Fusion is one example, and I'm just curious what you guys think about that. Um, I, I'm not that well-versed in, in TV, I mean, like, I'm a consumer of television, and, and my role at Fusion is more on the digital side and the TV side, but I mean, I feel incredibly excited about television in general, um, and have for at least a decade, because it's gotten better, it's awesome, and then you have shows like Orange is the New Black, um, I, I think that the, the, the increasing number of, of um, outlets or ways to consume or produce and, and, and communicate via television means that we're going to have a lot more awesome stuff, and a lot more awesome stuff means a lot more awesome stuff for, for and by women. Um, but I feel like Tabby is a better person at answering this question because she's... Ah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I just think about how, like, the good thing about technology now is that you can... Um, like find the best medium for the thing you're trying to express and TV is becoming something where like um, I don't know I to me it's just exciting that sorry this isn't well I guess I, I'm sorry it's just a regurgitation of like <laughs> because of the new all of the new formats or even like Vimeo um, or like that you can have a show on Vimeo but it's like legit and people like it and it doesn't have to be on a TV set and stuff like that um, just means that yeah, more voices. Yeah. Exciting. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi. Hi. Um, so you guys kind of started, you ended off talking about inclusivity and I guess uh, intersectionality a little bit. I just wanted to know, um, as women with such you know, large platforms, access to so many women, um, how do I, like, when did you guys realize the importance of intersectionality? If, when did you start writing in an intersectional lens, in an inclusive lens, and if it wasn't from its inception, if that makes sense, like, when did you guys as women um, realize that you obviously couldn't speak on the behalf of certain people that you may not, you know, you may not have had the same experience as? Like, when, 
Yeah. Not that realization. I think, um, so like the article that I mentioned written by the guy, um, for... Jake. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the thing with that was that it treated... My issue with that was that it treated, like, intersectionality or empathy or what he called, like, PC language as just, like, like, people get mad at you because they think you're being wrong. And it's like, no, when a girl says, like, hey, I don't feel represented by these photos, it's like, out it, like, no one's trying to, um, so I don't think there was, like, a moment. I think it was just, like, that, I don't know, it came from a place of, like, people want to be seen and heard. No one's trying to be, like, you're wrong, and I called you out, and gotcha. <laughs> um, to answer the question, I, I think that I've, I mean, I've always, oh, okay, I'll put it this way. The phrase intersectionality is not something that I had heard of until like eight years ago. Um, but did I try and live that in my life and in the work that I did? Yes. Not always, though. I mean, when I worked for Glamour, it was mostly, uh, it was a magazine geared towards Caucasian women. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying I was writing for white women. I'm not white, by the way. But 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 that that was that that was the that was the, the the audience they were going for. But did I think about this stuff? Did I think about the fact that there was no way that I could ever write from the perspective of a gay woman, or an Asian American woman, or a Native American woman? Absolutely, um, because I felt that that intersectionality was uh, within me that I, I had been living it. But I don't know that I had a word for it. It was certainly important to me, but I don't know that I, I wouldn't have used that word to describe it. I just would have been, I would have said something like diverse, um, representative. You know, I would have used something that was less specific. Okay. So this one's kind of more directed towards Tavi, but I feel like you were talking about how now with the internet, there's a lot more ways for girls and young women to get their voices heard. But I feel like also with that, there comes the pressure to have something to say, you know? Uh -huh. And I think what you've done is really inspiring, like, you know what you want to do and then you do it. But I think, have you ever felt like you want to do something, but you don't know what you want to do, you know? Yeah. I think in those periods, you just have to be okay with, like, not knowing what you want to say. And you just keep, like, taking things in. And that's a form of, like, preparing to make something later as well. And, I mean, that's great, too, because taking things in is great. Like, books and movies, like, they're wonderful, so... Um, yeah, I think I think one great thing about the internet is that it allows a lot of people the ability to say something and have it be heard. I think one of the worst things about the internet is that it pressures people to have something to say all the time. And I, you know, quite frankly, I think there's times when we should just be quiet and, and, and not, or at least not be as reactive as, as we are. I'm talking about Twitter, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, that like, that like, sometimes I think we could all be better served if we took a deep breath and saw how things played out, or like, informed an opinion and didn't just be as reactive. And I think there's a lot of pressure to be reactive, or to have a hot take, or to have an opinion. Um, and it's hard to do that, and, and then, you know, acknowledge that, that things evolve and change. I, I, I think there's just like a ton of media economy of, um, of, of hot takes, whether that's stuff that's on websites that are for profit, or whether it's on your Twitter feed, or on Facebook. And I wish, you know, I wish we could all kind of take a, deep, a deeper breath. But that's not about women at all, it's just about the internet economy. And actually, I mean, the great thing about the internet is it has empowered women to, to speak out. And one thing that I, that I felt with Jezebel was that there were a number of commenters on that site um, who were very prolific, who were oftentimes pain in the ass, but who went on to have writing careers because they started writing in the comments section of a website. I mean, like, and some of whom like, have written amazing violence places now. And I, the idea that the idea that the internet would have empowered them or that a community of other women would have empowered them to find their voice and to keep um, pushing themselves forward and, and, and find careers as writers is one of the best things I think that's the, the, the I've ever encountered, at least in my career. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks. <laughs> Um. Okay, I think that's all the time that we have. Sorry to pull the plug like that. So again, our theme is Women Changemakers. I want to thank these fantastic changemakers on our stage, Tavi and Anna, for being here for this fantastic conversation.